Hey Booktube, welcome to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. So I am back with New History on the Horizon, Episode 9. And um, the last one I posted had a lot of books that were already available, but and then a few that were coming out in May. Um, and today I've got some more. I've got a couple that are already out right now. And then I'm moving straight into the ones that are coming this uh, spring and summer. Oh yeah, this one just came out in February. All right, so let's start with University Press book. I'm really excited to read this. I've been reading a lot of fiction around this country. Um, I'm, I'm a, uh, I've got a few books now on this country that I'm, I'm intrigued by, and this one it looks. I can't wait to start reading it. It is India is broken. A people betrayed independence to today by Ashoka Modi. Uh, it's by Stanford University Press. I want to thank Stanford for this review copy. Um, cannot wait to get into it. I love learning about new, not new country, countries that have been out there, but I just haven't paid much attention to as far as, you know, reading to understand their history. Uh, I kind of want to, these are big dreams, I know. Um, I want to read a history in like every country that exists. What? <laughs> It's a big undertaking. Um, but I really want to dive into Indian history. Um, it, it is just, it's just uh, such a interesting history as far as how the, uh, you know, uh, relations with Britain, the Raj, um, and then just uh, the breakaway, the partition, their religious issues between um, Hindus and Muslims. Uh, their vibrant economy, uh, but yet just uh, population issues, um, poverty, just everything. It's just it's just a fascinating country to me, and beautiful. So, what is India? Is what what what, what angle do we have here on, on India is broken? I will tell you. When Indian leaders first took control of their government in 1947, they proclaimed the ideals of economic progress and secular democracy. Through the first half century of nation building, leaders could point to an uneven but measurable progress. After the mid 1980s, dire poverty declined for a few decades, inspiring declarations of victory. But today, a vast number of Indians struggle in a state of underemployment and are one crisis away from despair. Public goods, such as education, health, cities, air and water, and the judiciary are in woeful condition. Policymakers search for easy solutions that further undermine the provision of public goods and job creation. India is Broken is a history that informs the present, explaining how India landed in this economic catch-22. Challenging prevailing narratives, Modi contends that successive post-independence leaders, starting with the first Prime Minister, Jawal, Jawaharlal Nehru uh, failed to confront India's true economic problems. As popular frustration grew and corruption in politics became pervasive, India's economic growth relied increasingly on unregulated finance and environmentally destructive construction. Social norms and public accountability decayed, allowing for the rise of a violent Hindutva. Okay, I don't know if there's no explanation of that, but... Combining, st combining, st let's try that again. combining statistical data uh, with vignettes from cinema and literature to create strong, accessible, people-driven narratives, this book is a midi meditation on the interplay between democracy and economic progress, with lessons extending far beyond India. Modi proposes a path forward which, although fraught with its own peril, offers the best hope for the future. And this is our author. I don't know if that's of interest to you, but um, this book came out not very long ago. Uh, I'm very interested. I have a big biography on, like, Modi. Not the writer, uh, but the Prime Minister, the current one. Um, and he's just supposed to be, like, you know, big baddie. So uh, I'm, I'm intrigued. I want to learn more about how they got to where they are at now. So India is Broken, Stanford University Press. Ask your library for it, order it, put it on your TBR if you're interested in reading about other countries, uh, as I am. 
Oh, and I've been waiting for the. This one is out right now. This is a, a fiction read that I... <laughs> it's a delicious pleasure. I, obviously, he's a historian. He's a young, hip, cool historian. I've got all his books. And couldn't wait to see what he did with fiction. And I think many of you have already heard about this and have read it, but I have not. Dan Jones, baby. Essex Dogs. I'm really excited. I heard it's like really like gory and he really gets into the battle scenes and I'm just like that. Nah, I'm sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. Uh, what can I say? I'm, I'm down with that kind of stuff. And, um, so Dan Jones, Essex Dogs, a novel. It's July 1346. The Hundred Years War has begun and King Edward and his lords are on the march through France. But this war belongs to the men on the ground. Swept up in the bloody chaos, a tight-knit company from Essex must stay alive long enough to see their home again. With sword, axe, and longbow, the Essex dogs will fight from the landing beaches of Normandy to the blood-soaked field of Crecy. There's Pismire, small enough to infiltrate enemy camps. Scotsman, strong enough to tear down a wall. Millstone, a stonemason who will do anything to protect his men. Father, a priest turned devilish by the horrors of war. Romford, a talented young archer on the run from his past. And Loveday Fitz Talbot, their battle-scarred captain who just wants to get his boys home safe. Some men, some men fight for glory, others fight for coin. The Essex dogs, they fight for each other. You know what I'm saying? All right, Dan Jones. You know he's going to keep writing. He's a, he's a historian who just digs his his uh, his field of study. He digs it. You know he's into it. I yeah. I hope it's good. I hope he's a good fiction a writer as he is a um, historian. But I'm excited for this. This one's out now. I'm sure it's all over the place. Library bookstores probably soon to be released in paperback. Okay, so this book just came out at the end of February, and I wanted to share this with you guys. Very excited for this. This, I have never heard of this before, but I thought that I had. <laughs> then I read more, and I'm like, I haven't, but oh my gosh, I really want to read this. This is called Bobby Yar, um, the classic documentary novel of Nazi-occupied Ukraine by Anatoly Kuznetsov. Now this is a Picador edition, wonderful Picador edition. I wish I had more Picador editions, but um, so this one came out and has a new afterword by Masha Gessen, who's a fantastic writer on all things talking about current day Russia. Uh, she knows uh, Russia pretty much uh, inside and out. Oh, I trust her reporting. I really enjoy reading Masha Gessen. I've got several of her books. So, uh, what is this about? I'll read it to you. Oh, this comes from the introduction. So this is Masha Gessen talking. Um, Baba Yar was a different species of text. It had an identifiable point of view. You know what, let me, let me back away. This is the pub sheet. I'm just going to read the back because this might give you just a, a, more of a plot synopsis or what it's about. So, uh, At the age of 14, Anatoly Kuznetsov began keeping a diary of life in Ukraine under Nazi occupation. Years later, he combined those notebooks with other survivors' memories to create a classic work of documentary witness in the form of a novel. When a censored version of Bobby Yar was first published in a Soviet magazine in 1966, it became a literary sensation, not least for its powerful and unprecedented narratives of the Nazi massacre of the city's Jews, and later other victims at Kiev's Bobby Yar Ravine, one of the largest mass killings of the Holocaust. Presented here in its full, uncensored form, Bobby Yar is a classic of Holocaust and World War II testimony. With sustained immediacy, it relates a scrappy but principled boy's day-to-day -day fight to survive and provide for his family. He dodges bullets and avoids transport to Germany, wonders at the pomp of the Nazis' opera performances, overhears his mother and grandparents debate the merits of German versus Soviet rule, collects grenades and digs hiding places, and confronts the moral dilemmas of assisting neighbors or looting stores, all the while hearing the constant hum of bullets at the Babi Yar ravine nearby. Hmm. 
In the manner of Elie Wiesel's Night, or Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl, here is a book that tells some of the most uncomfortable truths of the past century and the most essential. So, this is out right now. Um, that this is your type of. It's, you know, it's not easy reading, but if you're okay with reading the darker times in history from a um, personal experience perspective, I think you definitely need to check out Kuznetsov and Baba Yar. Okay, now, now we're moving in to books coming out next month. Now, actually, I don't have the, the release date on this, but the good folks at Penguin Classics sent me a galley. Um, well, they emailed me first, and I said, heck yeah, I am. this is up my alley big time. We're talking military um, war reporting, and when you talk about war reporting, you can't talk about it without mentioning Ernie Pyle, right? Well, Penguin Classics is coming out with a new Penguin Classics of Ernie Pyle's Brave Men. And as you can see, this is just the galley version that's just kind of been bound with this. So, it doesn't have an index or anything yet, but uh, wow, you guys. I'm excited. Um, I don't have a pub sheet, but this is his classic reporting on... Um, let me see if I can... Okay, so I'll see if I can read a little bit of what he's covering here. It begins in June 1943. Um... Oh, all right, okay. Um, this might be. Um, hang on a second. Okay. Oh, we've got. Yeah, where there should be maps, there's nothing just yet, but we've got June to September 1943, Sicily. Um, let's see here. Suggestions for further reading. Let me read this little snippet from the. Um, I should have said the introduction is by David Christinger. So we've got. Ernie Pyle's Brave Men, and David Christinger writes the introduction, and um, he gives a nice little kind of uh, background on uh, Pyle, but he says here, why, why reprint Brave Men? Why now? The truth is that even though he's been dead for nearly eight decades, Pyle had so much to say about the world we find ourselves living in today. The horrors of Pyle's time are different from our own, of course, but not as different as we might like to believe. As I write these words, a great power in Europe spent years systematically flooding the media ecosystem with disinformation before invading a weaker power, who are we talking about here, simply because its leader convinced himself he must, because he asserted some unimpeachable claim to historical greatness, spawned in a climate of mistrust, heightened fear and despair. Meanwhile, thousands of men, women, and children are dying, many crushed under the rubble of bombed-out apartment buildings, some left ignominiously at the bottom of mass graves with their hands tied behind their backs. It's the kind of obscenity the world hasn't seen in Europe in decades, and it's a reminder that the stories we tell ourselves matter, and that perhaps the only effective means by which to defeat the untruth is to tell a better story something Pyle understood, even if he never articulated it exactly that way. Wow. Yeah, this is fantastic. I can't wait to read this. Um, so Brave Men, uh, it starts in Sicily, uh, goes from June to September 1943, um, covers D-Day uh, Sicily, um, so then, and then it moves from Sicily just into Italy proper, December 1943 through April 1944. A farewell to Italy, and then he moves into England, April to May 1944. And France, to, and in France, June sept to September 1944. I'm looking forward to reading this, and I, I bet all of you are as well. If you love Penguin Classics, when this comes out, uh, I'll try to get a date for you next time I talk. And I'll, I'll add it in. But this is this is coming, and I can't wait. Thank you, Penguin um, Classics, for the galley. I'll be reporting back on this one. This is this is one I want to read and talk about on this channel. So stay tuned.
All right. We've got a lot of soldier stories uh, and books coming out this spring. So this one is coming out. I'm trying to put these in some type of chronological order for you. All right. These are all coming out. Okay, so these two books are both coming out on May 30th. All right. This one I will be reviewing. Oh, no, this is not the one. But I might as... Oh, this makes sense. Hello. There's a theme here. These publicists know what's going on because they sent me this book. And he, the author is the, the one who wrote the introduction <laughs> to, to um, Brave Men. So it's David Christinger. So David Christinger has a book coming out. And it's also on early, Ernie Pyle. Why did I not just notice this? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to pair these two books together. <laughs> uh, this is coming out, and then we've got like a little mini biography of Ernie Pyle. The Soldier's Truth, Ernie Pyle and the Story of World War II by David Christinger. Again, Penguin Press this time. Uh, May 30th, it's coming out. So, I thought I had the, sh the pub sheet for this one. Uh, so not in the insert. I lost it. So this is fantastic. This is the man who I was just talking about who wrote this book. You know, okay. Ernie Pyle, here we go. At the height of his fame and influence during World War II, Ernie Pyle's nationally syndicated dispatches from combat zones shaped America's understanding of what the war felt like to ordinary soldiers as no writer's work had before or has since, from North Africa to Sicily, from the beaches of Anzio to the beaches of Normandy, and on to the war in the Pacific, where he would meet his end. Ernie Pyle had a genius for connecting with his beloved dog-faced grunts. A humble man, himself plagued by melancholy and tortured by marriage to a partner whose mental health struggles were much more acute than his own, Pyle was in touch with suffering in a way that left an indelible mark on his readers. While never a defeatist, his stories left no doubt as to the heavy weight of the burden soldiers carried. He wrote about post-traumatic stress long before that was a diagnosis. So in The Soldier's Truth, acclaimed writer David Christinger brings Pyle's journey to vivid life in all its heroism and pathos. Drawing on access to all of Pyle's personal correspondence, this book captures every dramatic turn of Pyle's war with sensory immediacy and a powerful feel for both the outer and the inner landscape. With a background in helping veterans and other survivors of trauma come to terms with their experiences through storytelling, Christinger brings enormous reservoirs of, of empathy and insight to bear on Pyle's trials. Woven in and out of his chronicle is the golden thread of his own travels across these same landscapes, many of them still battle-scarred, searching for the landmarks Pyle wrote about. Oh, this looks fantastic. A moving tribute to an ordinary American hero whose impact on the war is still too little understood, and a powerful account of that war's impact and how it is remembered, the soldier's truth takes its place among the essential contributions to our perception of war and how, to, how we make sense of it, if we even do. So, uh, it's really good, great timing that they've got both of these books coming out. Um, Penguin does, Ernie Pyle, and then, you know, his, his work. So, gosh, so, there's so much good reading coming coming our way. Um, put that on your, your TBR for a May, end of May. Okay, uh, this is a little slightly different, but this is also coming out at the end of May. This is coming from Norton, W.W. W. Norton. I've got a pub sheet so I can hold the book up while I am describing to you what's happening. Oh, these are all blurbs. What can I do with blurbs? I can't. This is Genealogy of a Murder, Four Generations, Three Families, One Fateful Night by Lisa Belkin. This is coming up May 30th. Okay, so I'll read from the back real quick here. Um, okay. Independence Day weekend, 1960. A young cop is murdered, shocking his small Connecticut town. The suspect, still at large, is, is described by police as a loner and a pro. But on a beach not too far away, a young army doctor, on vacation from his post at a research lab in a maximum security prison, faces the chilling realization 
that the shooter had help. It was the doctor himself who inadvertently set the murder into motion. Alvin Tarlov, David Troy, and Joseph DeSalvo were all born of the Great Depression, all with grandparents who'd left different homelands for the same American dream. How did one become a doctor, one a cop, and one a convict? The journalist Lisa Belkin traces the paths of each of these three men, one of them her stepfather. She examines the coincidences and choices that led to one fateful night and illuminates how we shape history even as we are shaped by it. Isn't that fascinating? Lisa Belkin sounds very familiar to me, but it says uh, doesn't say that she has another book under her belt. She's, um, she's a national correspondent at New York Times. I mean, I don't read the New York Times. I don't really, I don't get that subscript. That's too expensive. Um, I don't know. She sounds familiar, but Genealogy of a Murder, Four Generations, Three Families, One Fateful Night. Uh, sounds like a good read. W.W. W. Norton coming out May 30th. Okay. Aha. Yes. This book I have been commissioned to write a review for, for Shelf Awareness. Uh, now we're moving into June. So this is coming out in early June, also by Penguin Press. As I said, they've been putting out a lot of great uh, soldiers, kind of soldiers' memoirs and um, histories, biographies. This one takes us back to World War I, though, and I'm very intrigued by that. This is called Soldiers Don't Go Mad, a story of brotherhood, poetry, and mental illness during the First World War by Charles Glass. Feast your eyes on that one. Comes out June 6th in uh, Penguin Press. Don't have the pub sheet, so I'll read, I'll read a little bit here. Um, from the moment war broke out across Europe in, 19, in Europe 1914, the world entered a new unparalleled era of modern battle. Soldiers faced relentless machine gun fire, unprecedented artillery power, flamethrowers, and gas attacks. Within the first four months of the war, the British Army recorded the nervous collapse of 10% of its officers. The loss of such manpower to mental illness, not to mention death and physical wounds, left the military barely able to fill its ranks. Second Lieutenant Wilfred Owen was 24 years old when he was admitted to the newly established Craig Lockhart War Hospital for treatment of shell shock. A burgeoning poet, trying to make sense of the terror he had witnessed, Owen read a collection of poems from a fellow officer, Siegfried Sassoon, and was impressed by his portrayal of the soldier's plight. One month later, Sassoon himself arrived at Craig Lockhart. Having earned the military cross and been wounded, he refused on principle to fight again in what he called an unjust war. Um, let's see here. Drawing on rich source materials as well as Charles Glass's own experience of trauma and war, Soldiers Don't Go Mad tells for the first time the story of the soldiers and doctors who struggled with the effects of industrial warfare on the human psyche. Riding beyond the battlefields to the psychiatric couch of Craig Lockhart, the literary salons and the halls of power, Glass charts the experiences of Owen and Sassoon and of their fellow soldier poets, alongside the greater literary response to modern warfare. As he investigates the roots of what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, okay, uh, Glass brings historical bearing towards raving effects on mental health and the ways that creative work can help us through even the darkest of times. So, um, about 300 pages, a little bit less than three, no, about 300 pages. So, again, I'll be reviewing this for shelf awareness. Um, I'll, be, I'll start reading this towards the end of this month. Got lots of other things that I gotta finish first, but this is coming up June 6th. The other book <laughs> that's coming out June 6th, which I'm also gonna try to read at the same time that I'm reading Soldiers Don't Go Mad, and I've been commissioned to write a review for for shelf awareness, is First Family George Washington's Heirs and the Making of America by Cassandra A. Good. This is put out by Hanover Square Press. Um, so this is kind of cool. It takes us way back, getting back into revolutionary times. Um, it's a nice beefy read, over 400 pages. While it's widely known in America that George and Martha Washington never had children of their own, few are aware that they raised numerous children together. Well, I knew that. I think a lot of you did. Um, in First Family, we see Washington as a father figure, as well as, as well as meet the children he helped raise and trace their complicated roles in American history. The children of Martha Washington's son by her first marriage 
Eliza, Patty, Nellie, and Wash Cost Custis were born into life in the public eye. Raised in the country's first first family, they remained well known as Washington's family and keepers of his legacy throughout their lives. By turns petty and powerful, glamorous and cruel, the Custises used Washington as a means to enhance their own power and status. As enslavers committed to the American empire, the Custis family embodied the failures of the American experiment that finally exploded into civil war, uh, all the while being celebrities in a soap opera of their own making, as we know. Um, Robert E. Lee married into the Custis family, uh, his wife uh, Mary. She was she had a lot of names, and Custis was one of them. So you know she was a Custis, Mary Mary Custis, right? Yeah. First family brings new focus and attention to the surprisingly neglected aspect of George Washington's life and legacy, as the country grapples with concerns about political dynasties and the public role of presidential families, the saga of Washington's family offers a human story of historical precedent. All right, so this will be published June 6th, Hanover Square Press, First Family, George Washington's Heirs in the Making of America by Cassandra A. Good. So these are two I will be starting a later this month. Got one more. I think we'll call it good for for today. I've got more packages that just arrived the last few days downstairs, so there will be a new another new history on the horizon soon, but uh, just not yet. Okay. Now we're moving into July. So I know it's a little we're getting a little further out there. Um, this sounds juicy and good, and I like stuff like this. Ooh. This is Under the Eye of Power: How Fear of Secret Societies Shapes American Democracy by Colin Dickey, who also wrote Ghostland. This is put out by Viking Books. It's coming out July 11th. Okay, so I'll hold that up. Really intriguing cover here. Um, see, Under the Eye of Power, Colin Dickey returns with a timely investigation of America's fringe beliefs regarding secret societies and how paranoia and moral panics surrounding subterranean groups has curtailed political reform throughout the centuries. Dickey asks, why do so many people, including some of the most powerful people in the country, continue to subscribe to these conspiracy theories? The answers surprise Dickey and may surprise you as well. Um, we'd like to assume these panics exist only at the fringes of society, or are unique features of the Internet age, but history tells us they are actually woven into the fabric of American democracy. Well, right, you've got the eye and the, the dollar bill. All this stuff is, is kind of creepy, but, you know, anyway, there's, there's, there's a story behind it. Uh, from Salem Witch Trials to QAnon, Under the Eye of Power investigates how every generation has faced moral panics surrounding secret groups poised to take over America. Whether they are the Freemasons, Illuminati, Abolitionists, the Catholics, those Catholics, I tell you, bent on world domination, um, just kidding, socialists and anarchists, the FBI and the CIA, or Satanists. Uh, ultimately, by uncovering the history of each of these groups and conspiracies, Dickey illuminates what is happening in our current moment. Uh, that sounds fascinating, though. Let's see what kind of chapters he's got on here. <laughs> I got some funny chapter headings. Um, chapter 20, 20, uh, 22. Attack of the Lizard People. <laughs> uh, this is good stuff. I'm all for it. Yeah. There's so many secret societies and, uh, yeah, Freemasons. I still don't understand what the hell they do. I've got a book on it. I need to start reading it. I know, um, uh, I know Jason in Ireland could tell me, Jason Harrigan could tell me all about the Freemasons, what they're about, but, um, yeah, I gotta get going on some of that research. <laughs> um, so, yeah, from Viking Books, coming out July 11th, Under the Eye of Power. Colin Dickey. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is New History on the Horizon number nine. 
Please do let me know what you think of these books in the comments below, and I look forward to hearing from all of you soon. I hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining me here on the History Shelf. I'll have more uh, books to show you. I got some theology books I keep mentioning and I need to get these filmed. I really want to show you and I really want to get them up on my new bookcase, my bookshelves in the master bedroom. Um, so anyway, uh, having said that, oh and I have some book hauls that I still need to film as well. There's, there's a lot. But I didn't buy any books over Lent, so there you have it. And Lent ended on Easter Sunday. And yes, I bought a few books after Easter ended because, you know, I... I'm free to do that now, but I'm not going crazy like I used to because I realized I've got plenty here But until next time booktube. Thanks for joining me here on the history shelf and come back and see me soon. Take care. Bye